and thank you for joining us on The Spin Room. I'm your host, Ami Kaufman. Our three spin doctors today are former Canadian ambassador to Israel, Vivian Berkovich, from our studios in New York, Midi's bureau chief and senior investigative reporter at Breitbart, Aaron Klein, and from our studios in Washington, D.C., the director of policy and government relations at Americans for Peace Now, Deborah Shushan. Thanks for coming on the show, guys. Good to see you. Great to be here. Our four topics of discussion today with our esteemed guests are Palestinian Authority reprimands U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman for making a condolence visit in the West Bank. We'll then discuss the five-month prison sentence handed down to an Arab poet in Israel for poems she wrote on Facebook. Afterwards, we'll tackle the never-ending uproar over Israel's controversial nation-state law. And we'll end with a question. Is Donald Trump's policy towards Iran changing after he suggests meeting the Islamic Republic's president, Hassan Rouhani? Okay, our first topic is the U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, who went on Monday to visit the widow of Yotam Ovadia, a 31-year-old seller and father of two who was murdered by a, Palestinian, uh, by a Palestinian in a stabbing attack last week. Last night, the Palestinian Authority slammed the ambassador for his, quote, recurring visits to Jewish settlements in the West Bank, stating the Palestinians view them as, quote, a provocation. I want to start with uh, you, Deborah. You know, Friedman, he's not the first ambassador to visit a settlement to go to the West Bank. What do you make of this condemnation from the Palestinians of a condolence visit? Well... Even though it is true that Friedman is not the first U.S. ambassador uh, to do so, there were a couple of occasions uh, on which Dan Shapiro, the previous U.S. ambassador, did go to settlements. We have seen uh, a real market shift, obviously, in terms of the way that uh, the U.S. government and specifically the U.S. ambassador view the settlements. I mean, this is an ambassador who has a, uh, a long personal history before he became part of the U.S. government and the U.S. representative uh, in Israel of supporting the settlements. As far as the, the condemnation of the Palestinian Authority, uh, I mean, I think on the one hand it is important to condemn any killing that occurs, including ki killings of settlers in the West Bank. Uh, but uh, I also understand very much their concern about seeing this shift in terms of the way that the U.S. Embassy approaches uh, the, the West Bank and the settlements there. Okay. Vivian, do these visits by Friedman uh, to the West Bank show indeed a bias? Should he maybe refrain from them? I think that we really have to separate a condolence visit to a shiva from other views he may express from time to time. I think those are very different circumstances. And Dan Shapiro went at least twice to Shiva visit. To, to Shiva visit, to, to condolence visit. At least twice. I like went that, yeah. as well um, when I was serving. When you were investor. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, and Dan Shapiro, there was no criticism, no criticism of him for doing that. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you're, if there's just a level of respect. Someone's been murdered. Someone, they're sitting and grieving. Right. And I really don't think that going to a shiva on the other side of the green line in any way prejudges the outcome of eventual negotiations. And that's the credo. That's the mantra. Oh, you go out and you pay your respects to someone who's been murdered and somehow you're prejudging the outcome of negotiations. It's malarkey. Malarkey. Uh, Aaron, you know, the, the, the Palestinians perceive the Trump administration and, and, and I guess particularly its, its envoys to be completely one-sided regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Are they right? Do they have a point? Abbas and the Palestinian Authority have zero credibility on this issue. Uh, what are we even talking about here? The Palestinian Authority has rejected every single offer of a Palestinian state, including handing them over large sections of the West Bank. So the fact that the Palestinians don't have a state is the Palestinians' fault, given that they bolted all negotiations and then instead usually started intifadas or terror wars. Um, uh, what is Abbas saying here? That a Jew who lives in Judea and Samaria and the West Bank, uh, by the way, there are archaeological, historical connections to Judaism there, that a Jew who lives there is less human, uh, that a U.S. ambassador can't visit a Jew living in the West Bank. Uh, and also this comes as Abbas continues to incite uh, against Israel repeatedly, and then all of a sudden we now see a terror attack, Palestinian a terror attack, that he very likely incited, and certainly his media, in the West Bank. So why doesn't he, instead of criticizing the U.S. Ambassador Friedman, why doesn't he apologize 
for the continued incitement that led to the very attack that prompted Friedman to go to the West Bank in the first place. Yeah, Deborah, I want to ask you about that. I mean, your reaction, of course, to what Aaron just said, but also the fact that it doesn't really help when Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority don't condemn the attack. I, I think attacks should be condemned, as I indicated in my previous answer. Uh, but I also think, you know, I'm, Aaron, of course, uh, uh, basically took the opportunity there to issue his, I'm sure, standard uh, condemnation of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, but to shift back to the Trump administration here, uh, we have an administration that has been entirely one-sided, uh, that condemns every attack that occurs to a, an Israeli settler or an Israeli uh, citizen living within the Green Line. And when there are uh, killings of Palestinians, when there are scores of Palestinians killed in Gaza, uh, what do we hear from the U.S. administration? We hear, of course, that it's all the fault of Hamas. So we, we see a totally this. uneven handed approach here by, uh, by the U.S. administration. No, okay. And it, it does make a statement. No, I mean, we should keep. Uh, I, let me just, so I'll just finish there by saying we should keep in mind that when the U.S. ambassador to Israel goes to a settlement across the Green Line to make a, a Shiva visit, it makes a statement about the territory which he covers as being ambassador to Israel as including uh, the area across okay, the Green okay, Line. Right. And I, I have think a very we quick should question. see that there is something should... problematic okay, about that. Vivian. I have a very quick question. When Dan Shapiro crossed to, to do Shiva visits, did he make the same statement? When Dan Shapiro when he crossed uh, did, the did green he, line, did he make the same when he statement? crossed the green when Dan Shapiro crossed yep. the green line? He was making shiva calls to the family of Israeli officials, right? Rather, and so you can see that uh, you I could see. argue that that so is part have, of okay. his duty so as U.S. ambassador you know to Israel. I, really, I don't know. I'd love to get Dan Shapiro on now. I'm willing to bet you that Dan Shapiro also went and did shiva calls to the homes of terror victims, including the ones that I did when those three boys were murdered, the the yeshiva boys. Um, by the Hamas uh, killers a few years ago, right before the 14 war. Mm -hmm. I went to all three Shiva houses. At least one was on the other side of the Green Line, and I'm pretty sure that Dan did too. Having said that, this parsing and making you, up... May, let me may I no, ask I want to speak did... now. I want to speak now. <laughs> the parsing and, and you know, every, Please, yeah. every issue, you kind of got a different grade. One thing is, I mean, to compare, Israel doesn't condemn the deaths of Palestinians in Gaza who are coming to, on their march of return and engaging in violence openly and proudly. So you're comparing, Israel doesn't condemn those deaths, which it causes, you say, yeah. to the death murder of a man at 9 p.m. In, near his home, in his settlement. Those are not comparable. And if your position is that those are comparable, okay. then hey, no, one more thing. And Israel does issue statements constantly, constantly regretting the loss of life. You're comparing Palestinians in Gaza who were murdered to the murder of this man outside his home? All right, let's let her answer. Are you doing that? Because that's what you just did. Um, uh can I ask you a question, Vivian, since you were Canadian ambassador to Israel? Uh, and I believe it was on your watch, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, members of the Dwabshe family were murdered in the West Bank. Did you also go to the West Bank at that point to make a I wasn't allowed to go call? to the West Bank. I wasn't allowed to go to the West Bank. That was for our representative. That was a very clear direction. You were only allowed to go to West Bank settlements. I went to a West Bank settlement. Wait, you on, did say that you crossed. Topic. For what permission. about answering her question? I didn't question. ask for permission. Answer my question. I asked you a question first. Please do me the courtesy of responding. Well, we have 30 seconds left. Uh, sure, I'll be I'll be happy to answer your question. First of all, we're not talking about the Israeli government, although if we were to talk about that, uh, we could talk about the statements that the Israeli government makes that regrets the loss of life, uh, but uh, blames everything ultimately on Hamas when we're talking about you're uh, protests you're you're, 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 that you're, you're, many of which, okay. a large proportion of which were peaceful that are right. happening on the Gaza side go, of the oh, fence. Very peaceful, uh, yeah, but I'll we're talking about the policy of the U.S. government, and, and which has shifted dramatically. We have to go for a quick. Break. Wait, Deborah, let me come back. This second, let me come back. More with Deborah Shushan, Aaron Klein, and Vivian Berkovich. Stay with us.
In the Holy Land, there are wonders most people never get to see. I-24 News will take you inside the shadows and unravel the secrets of some of the world's most revered sites in a way you've never experienced. All access from every angle. Tune in to Sacred Sites 360, Sunday, 9 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. I'm David Schuster. And I'm Shana Stulet. Join us on I-24 News for our show, Crossroads. We bring you a comprehensive and engaging look at the global news and opinions from the crossroads of America. Weeknights beginning at 6 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. with Aaron Klein, Deborah Shushan, and Vivian Berkowitz still talking about the uh, conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, Governor Mike Huckabee is uh, visiting the country. He participated in the uh, symbolic construction of a home in the West Bank settlement of Efrat. And he spoke beneath a uh, large banner reading, Building, uh, uh, Build Israel Great Again, and said that he knows the U.S. president is similarly supportive of construction. Let's listen to some more of the remarks that he said at this ceremony in Efrat today. I think it's a recognition of uh, what many of us have hoped for for a long time, that we would recognize Judea and Samaria um, as vital parts of the long-term future for the state of Israel. Aaron, is uh, building more in the settlements going to bring the sides any closer together? What about the Palestinians accepting a state? But, you know, let, let's go back to when Israel evacuated from Gush Katif, from the Jewish communities of the Gaza Strip. Uh, President Bush at the time uh, sent a letter that was supposed to enshrine American policy in that letter stating that Israel would not be expected in the future to evacuate the entire West Bank, to evacuate all Jewish communities from the West Bank. Um, and so anyone who believes that Israel is going to uproot uh, 200,000 or more Jews living in Judea and Samaria is delusional. Uh, the, there is no problem, I believe, with Jewish construction in already existing Jewish communities. Mm. And to believe that somehow the construction, that Jews building homes, is the core of the conflict is absurd. Okay. The core of the conflict is and has always been uh, the Palestinian refusal to accept the state and their advocacy for the destruction of Israel. Deborah, your uh, Israel has that. shown time okay. and again that yeah. they are willing to make painful concessions. Okay, Deborah, go ahead, Deborah. You know, it, it's extremely sad uh, that, that Mike Huckabee, this ally of President Trump, not to mention uh, the father of his press secretary, uh, has made has made this visit under the, the banner of, you know, building, making Israel great again. Uh, the this administration, once again, even though Mike Huckabee is not an official in this administration, he's close to this administration. We see once again that the the policy of successive Democratic and Republican administrations uh, is being overturned here as the Trump administration and its surrogates and allies are indicating its support for increased building rather than scaling down or settlement mm. freezes in the West Bank, uh, which are going to condemn Israel to a future uh, which looks like we're moving toward annexation of the West Bank, a future in which Jews uh, will be a minority in, in the Jewish state, and in which uh, the only way that you're going to have a Jewish state is by, is by instituting okay. apartheid. This and this is not something that friends of Israel or purported friends of Israel should be doing. It's, it's a shame. Building more in the settlements, Vivian, as Mike Huckabee says, it's going to help Israel, harm Israel? Um, I'm not, I never have been a huge supporter of the settlements. Mm. Um, so I, I would uh, shockingly tend to agree with those who are against it. Right. With Deborah. Uh, <laughs> no, I was thinking about saying that and then I held back. You held back. <laughs> Sorry, Deborah. <laughs> I think but, you agree uh, on it. No, no, no. Because I don't. Um, I just don't think it's it's what we should have been doing for the last 35 years. It was started by labor governments, as we all know. Yeah. We know the reasons why, or the purport, purported reasons why. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very troubled by the very settlements troubled. and everything that uh, okay. they portend. I want to move on to our next topic, and that is the apparent uh, thin line between freedom of speech and incitement. 
Arab poet Doreen Tatur was sentenced to five months in prison yesterday. An Israeli citizen, Tatur, was convicted in May of incitement to violence and supporting terrorist organizations based on her social media posts. She was arrested in October 2015 during the height of what was known as the Knife Intifada after posting, among others, a poem titled, Resist My People, Resist Them. The indictment included the translation of the poem with the lines, I will not succumb to the peaceful solution, never lower my flags until I evict them from my land, and resist my people, resist them, resist the settlers' robbery, and follow the caravan of martyrs. Following the sentencing, uh, Tatur said, I didn't expect justice. The prosecution was political to begin with because I'm Palestinian, because it's about free speech, and I'm imprisoned because I'm Palestinian. I'll start with you again, Vivian. You know, uh, 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 a leading legal expert here in Israel called uh, Professor Mordechai Kremnitzer wrote today uh, in Haaretz, he, shall I say, agrees with Tatur. The headline of his uh, op-ed is, Israeli Arab poets sentencing proves Israel has separate laws for Jews and Arabs. And he brings examples of rabbis who have incited over the years uh, against Arabs and who have never sat uh, in jail. Are Tatur and Kremenser corrupt? Would an Israeli Jew writing things of this character, for example, in Simon against Arabs, would they sit in jail? Uh, I don't want to speculate because it's so sensitive. And as someone who used to practice, I was a defamation right. lawyer. I, was, I worked for the press. I was always on, on for the press. Um, and so I'm a really, really staunch supporter, of course, of freedom of the press and free speech. But do you, do you see... I don't know. I see the similarities. Yeah. And the reason I don't want to agree or disagree is I simply don't know the facts. Mm. I don't know the cases. Mm -hmm. If I were to suspend disbelief and accept that there have been people on the Jewish side of the equation right. um, who have, you know, uttered hateful... Um, you know, words that incite to violence. Yeah. And I think there have been. Um, my question is, why have they not been right. prosecuted? I mean, I'm not sure that she's an angel. Okay. Like, she may meet the she incitement may test legally, but if there's an imbalance in terms of cases that are followed and prosecuted, that's a concern for a democratic country. So, Aaron, yeah, speaking of democracy, Aaron, the left says this is an infringement on freedom of speech, that a democracy should know how to deal with any kind of comments. Uh, what do you think? Is this not hurting freedom of speech in Israel? The of course not. This is not a freedom of speech issue. Even here in the United States, where we have a First Amendment, I think that she probably would have also been uh, tried and convicted for supporting terror. There, there, this was not something that was open to interpretation. She called for people to join the caravan of martyrs while on the, uh, her words were put to images of Palestinians carrying out violence against Israel, including mm. Israeli soldiers. And she did this at an incredibly sensitive time, 2015, at the height of uh, this uh, repeated cycle of stabbings oh, and crazy. shooting attacks inside the Jewish state, basically yeah. the knife intifada. Yeah. So this is not a First Amendment so, issue. The, so, I don't see the difference between what she did so, and the constant propaganda put out by Al-Qaeda and Hamas. Okay. Just because she's a poet, that doesn't give her the right so, to openly support uh, basically terror against Israel. Okay, Deborah, Deborah, you know, in today's era of social media where many youngsters are inspired by what they see on Facebook and Twitter, isn't Israel right to pay extra attention to what's written uh, there for the safety of its citizens, especially during, you know, what happened back there in 2015? Let's look at the context here. And the, the issue at hand should be equal treatment under the law. So we have a situation where Ms. Tatur, who was an unknown individual, a poet without much following, uh, who lived in a small town in the Galilee and posted a, a poem on Facebook that got something like 23 likes. She was then elevated uh, to this status of an insider by the Israeli government, by, for example, culture minister Miri Regev, who decided she wanted to score political points by sharing this post and in that way uh, gaining a much wider audience for the post than it had originally. Mm. So if you want to think about whether this poem had an impact, uh, the impact that it got arguably from someone fam <laughs> from someone well known, a public figure like Miri Regev, is likely a lot bigger Definitely. than that of, of this Definitely. unknown poet sharing it in the first place. But the key Quickly. issue, I really want to return here to that excellent piece to... that you cited. Deborah, Deborah, uh, by wait, Professor I'm going to have to cut you off. I'll let you, when, uh, when we come back from the break, I'll let you uh, fill in uh, that blank that I'm putting there now. When we come back, more with Vivian Berkovich, Aaron Klein, and Deborah Shushan, by the way.
coffee, honey? Mm -hmm. Roku Express. Now 500,000 movies and TV episodes? This is the ultimate streaming adventure. Jack. Oh, great choice. Hey, where's my coffee? Our world is becoming increasingly connected. 6.5 million Wi-Fi enabled devices are now shipping every day. Global consumer internet traffic is growing exponentially with 2.8 billion internet users consuming video at a breathtaking rate. We are creating breakthrough technologies that connect millions of people and billions of devices and securing our place as the most trusted business and technology. We are Eris and we're powering your digital world. Get I-24 News anywhere, anytime. Download our app. I-24 News. See beyond. What you need to know. The news. Fast and to the point. And the in-depth interviews that will keep you in your seat. From the people that you trust. I-24 News presents The New Rundown. Co-hosted by Nurit Ben and Kalev Ben David. Only on I-24 News. back on the spinner with Deborah Shushan, Aaron Klein, and Vivian Berkovich. And I want to go quickly back to Deborah Shushan, who I cut off before the break. You want to talk about that Professor Mordechai Kremitzer article in uh, Haaretz. Go ahead. Right. So let's return to that and this issue of equal treatment under law. So we have the case of Doreen Tatur, and then we have uh, the case of rabbis in Israel, as, as Mordechai Kremnitzer talks about in that article. He gives the example, for example, of, of the uh, Torah Tamelech rabbis in the mm -hmm. West Bank. Yeah. We're talking here about influential West Bank rabbis, right? right. Not just some obscure uh, Palestinian Arab uh, Israeli poet in the Galilee. Influential Israeli rabbis who wrote that in their halachic judgment, uh, that halacha uh, allows the killing of Arabs in many circumstances. Uh, there was a, a lawsuit that was brought, and it was ultimately dropped by the state back in 2012. Mm -hmm. Compare that to the case of Doreen Tatur, who gets five months in prison. But we don't have to stop there. I mean, let's look back, for example, uh, prior to the death of Yitzhak Rabin, at those rabbis who issued essentially a fatwa right. uh, against Yitzhak Rabin and said that according to the principle of Dean Rodef, uh, that he could and should be killed uh, yeah. because of the policies that he was pursuing with the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And then, in fact, the prime minister was assassinated. was assassinated. And none of the rabbis who engaged in that kind of incitement that actually had an impact were, were brought to okay. justice. So Point where made. is the equal treatment under law here? Point made. Point made. I, all right. We have to move on to our next topic. That is the nation state law. 180 uh, artists, authors, and intellectuals, including Amosos, David Grossman, A.B. Yoshua, and more, have signed a petition calling for the cancellation of the law. Polls show, not surprisingly, as you can see on your screen now, that a majority of Israeli uh, Jews are in favor of the law, 52%, while a majority of Arab citizens oppose it. The monthly peace index poll of uh, the Israeli Democracy Institute in Tel Aviv University shows that. Um, what, what's your take on that? I'll start with you, Vivian. Despite the media uproar that we've been seeing over the past, uh, over a week now, maybe 10 days, a majority of Jews do support that bill. What does that prove? Is that proof um, that Netanyahu uh, was right in pushing this, that he understands his country better than everybody else, basically? Um, I, I, it may prove um, that a purported majority of Jews, yeah. as it says, support it. Yeah. I don't know if it proves that Netanyahu is right or wrong in our sense country. Polls, uh, unless I see the questions and see how they were asked, it's very, very difficult to just accept polls. Right. Sorry to do that to you, but because mm -hmm. there's so many really lousy polls. So I'm not prepared to accept this shot in it's the dark. It's just basically, do you support, do you not support? That's It's a simple question. Yeah, you, well, yeah, you got to see how the question's asked, okay. because it does make Point a difference. Taken. Having said that, yeah. I mean, look, there's clearly a constituency that feels very strongly about this and agrees that it should have been done. Mm -hmm. um, 
the question, I mean, the real question is why now and why in the way it was done? Right. Aaron, what, what do you say to, to critics who say that this law establishes uh, Jewish supremacy and uh, Arab inferiority? You know, what I think is that the media really bears a lot of responsibility here for driving wedges between uh, the Jewish community and the larger Israeli Arab community, the Druze community. Um, and we're seeing that now play out in the Israel Defense Forces, which should not in any way, shape, or form be political. What is the uproar here? Israel has been a Jewish state since its founding. The only thing that Israel did is actually announce that and enshrine that in a law whereas Israel also has um, basic law that provides for equal treatment of everybody within, uh, living within the Jewish state. So to me, I think that this is a lot of media uh, incitement of one segment of society against the other, and I think that the polls are starting to show that. Okay, I also think that the way that mm. uh, the media is blowing three officers who uh, have a problem with that and the idea of out of proportion when you have thousands of Druze serving right now. Let's see where this goes yeah. and whether at the end of the day you're the media has egg on their you're face. You're obviously, I just want to tell our viewers what you're talking about, those three Druze IDF officers who voiced their discontent with the law. Two of them decided to resign and a third one was kind of penalized or reprimanded for mixing politics. Let's bring in Deborah though. What do you think? Were you surprised, Deborah, by, by the poll numbers? 52% of the Jews uh, supporting this uh, law? No, not particularly surprised by those poll numbers, and I'm not uh, surprised either. I mean, if you drill down on those poll numbers, you'll also see uh, the fragmentation within Israeli society. It's not just a, a separation between Jewish Israelis, a majority of whom, although not a dramatic majority of whom, support the law and obviously uh, Palestinian yeah. citizens of Israel who overwhelmingly uh, oppose it. You'll also see quite a bit of division among Israeli Jews uh, in terms of which party they support. Uh, obviously, supporters of the Jewish Home Party, for example, 90-some percent of them support it. Uh, and if you look at uh, supporters of uh, Zionist Union or Meretz, obviously it's, it's dramatically different and the majority oppose. So it, it shows you what we already know, yeah. that there's a great deal of fragmentation in Israel and not just between the Israeli and Palestinian Arab communities. Mm. Uh, but the okay. Druze issue here uh, is, really is, um, is fascinating and it's dramatic. And it is not one, obviously, that is, uh, in contrast to what we seem to be hearing from Aaron, that is stirred up by the media. It is, it is one that goes extremely deep. And I, if I could for just a second, Ami, Ver I want to relate an anecdote here. Okay, really quickly, though, really quickly, Deborah. Okay, really quickly. So just over a year ago, I was in Israel uh, in July of 2017. Um, I was actually up on the Temple Mount the day before the Temple Mount shooting, uh, in which two uh, military, po two police were killed, both of whom were Druze. Druze yes. And in the days after that, I had the opportunity with a Tel Aviv University delegation to go to Horfish, uh, the hometown of those uh, Israeli Druze officers. And I heard the father and who was also the uncle, uh, the father of one we of those officers seconds, and the uncle of the other. Uh, Shakib Shnan give a eulogy in which he ended dramatically by saying Chai Medinat Yisrael three times, long live the state of Israel. Yes. This is a community that is that has been okay. committed to the state of Israel, yes, that and, has died for the state of Shakib, Israel, and, and that Shakib has Shanan, now been forsaken that's by right, the state of Israel. That's right, Shakib Shnan is on I-24 quite a bit as a regular contributor. Here when we come back, more with Vivian Berkovich, Aaron Klein, and Deborah Shushan. Thank you. Americans have simply lost trust in news media. What happened to the news? All I get is a daily serving hey, media. Do your job and just tell me. I'm news. overloaded with news that is useless. Give me the facts. Let me sort Where's it. Where's the integrity? The news is Why is the news so bad? I will never trust the media. on I-24 News. Join me on High Definition right here for an in-depth understanding of Israel's diverse society in groundbreaking documentaries. I-24 News.
David Schuster and I-24 News. Join us on Stateside. It's our channel's flagship broadcast, and it features our best reporting and analysis of news from around the world and from here in the United States. Watch Stateside, weeknights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. The Middle East cradle of civilization, epicenter of the major crisis and conflicts that affect our world today. I-24 News is a witness. Our journalists live and breathe there every day. Get all the latest from our studios in Tel Aviv, New York, Washington, and Paris. As news happens where it happens. I-24 News. See beyond. Deborah Shusha and Aaron Klein and Vivian Berkowitz still talking about the uh, nation state law. I want to talk a little about, you know, the PR war. It's been covered internationally quite extensively, Vivian. It's not getting really, shall I say, good coverage. Doesn't necessarily make Israel look that great. Is this a war that Israel, a PR war that Israel can win? Uh, I think it's, you know, that whole PR Hasbara war, I yeah. think that uh, it's very difficult for Israel to win because I think there are many, many reasons that various institutions and interests just don't support Israel and will never support Israel no matter what it yeah. does. That's my nihilistic view. But do you think it's doing harm? I mean, internationally at least, the way it's portrayed? Absolutely it's doing harm, but I don't know that it's doing any more harm than anything else. I mean, you know, we, we see much of the Western media and more than a few governments sort of making comments about, you know, apartheid. God knows even Secretary of State Kerry, you know, yes. had uh, a leaked he comment. He used the A-word. He used the A-word. <laughs> and um, that stuff is much more damaging in my view because it's not an apartheid state. It's a very, very fraught country in right. many ways. Um, but this kind of like eagerness to slam Israel for being an apartheid state, eagerness to slam Israel over something like the nation state law, which is controversial. Yeah. I've never heard anyone criticize anyone criticize Abbas for saying, and when we have our Palestinian state in bank, West Bank, there will not be a single Jew left. How many times has he said that? Mm. No one has challenged him on that. Okay, Aaron, uh, speaking of international press, does, does it, whether, I'm not asking you whether there, you know, Israel is apartheid state or not, I'm asking you, does it make it easier? Does it make it easier for people to call Israel an apartheid state when the nation state law was passed? I don't think it should matter. Uh, those who are anti-Israel forces in the media or in the activist community are going to continue to be. If you could have uh, Israel defend itself against a Hamas-instigated war on its borders in which Hamas openly announced uh, that they're coming in to storm Israel's borders, murder Jews, uh, in which Hamas openly used civilians as human shields, and still, and still the media could cover that as um, both sides, the whole equal treatment, disproportionate force, then that really shows that plus, of course, the United Nations uh, condemnations continually singling out Israel repeatedly. It shows that Israel really needs to stop paying attention to the way that it is perceived in the international arena and assert its sovereignty, which is what it is doing, assert its right to self-defense, which Benjamin Netanyahu has been doing, uh, and stop paying attention. But at okay. the same time, Israel now has an ally in the Trump administration, and I think that this really gives a lot of strength to Israel, to the Israeli government, to finally do what it's right, do what's right on so many issues. And on the other hand, you have the Palestinian Authority rejecting the, uh, this Trump peace plan before it even comes out. So let's frame things appropriately 
and look at the overall picture and see how Israel, anyway, is going to be isolated okay. in the international. I was, I was gonna, I was gonna move to our next topic, but I just saw Deborah uh, snurking there. So Deborah, quickly, give me a quick response there. This is not a, an issue primarily about PR. I mean, obviously, it's making it harder for uh, for yeah. supporters of Israel uh, to defend Israel abroad. And we've had high profile people like Martin Indyk and Dan Shapiro make exactly that point. But this is primarily an issue uh, that is of concern to Israelis themselves and the future of the state they live in rather than a PR issue for okay. Israel abroad. I want to move quickly to our last topic of the day. That is Iran. On Monday, U.S. <laughs> President Donald Trump declared that he would be willing to meet Iranian President Hassan Rouhani without preconditions to discuss how to improve relations. But senior Iranian officials have rejected Trump's offer as worthless and, quote, a humiliation after he acted to reimpose sanctions on Tehran following his withdrawal from a landmark nuclear deal. Let's do the impossible, Vivian, try to get into Trump's head. What do you think his game plan why is? Me? Why me? <laughs> Just because you're a former diplomat, that's why. Never been accused of being a diplomat. Okay. Look, I think, <laughs> why, why is he doing this? I don't, I think this is just the way he works. I think yeah. that he, he's, um, you know, I think he's intemperate. I think he's um, very spontaneous. Um, impetuous, I might even say, uh -huh. and he gets ideas and he blurts them out, right. whether it be on Twitter or in other contexts, I'm sure. So that's my armchair psychoanalysis of the guy. And Is there anything wrong with him meeting Rouhani? Would, would you support the idea? Would it sound like a good I idea? Actually, I, I don't think there's um, anything wrong with him doing it. Yeah. Uh, I really don't. Yeah. Um, as long as he's properly prepared. <laughs> okay, Deborah, what do you think? Would it be a good idea for Donald Trump to meet uh, uh, President Rouhani? <laughs> I, I don't think it's a good idea for Donald Trump, frankly, to leave the White House and meet with anybody. Uh, I, I think that uh, his diplomacy doesn't do anybody any good. And, uh, I, I, you know, and in terms of, of trying to figure out what on earth is going on in Donald Trump's head, uh, you know, we could psychoanalyze him. I'll chip in my two cents. Uh, I think there is no point in trying to figure out, uh, you know, try to connect various points and, and, uh, and data points to try to figure out what a Trump doctrine is. I think this is a guy, and I'll agree with Vivian right. here, who uh, uh, thinks okay. off the top of his head and frankly is megalomaniacal and thinks <laughs> that, uh, you know, that he is somebody who can make a deal that's never been made before. He's uh, condemned the Iran deal uh, out of hand, obviously, and pulled the U.S. out of it, uh, and has this myth in his head that there is some sort of a better deal and that he, being Donald Trump, right. uh, is able to bring it about. Yeah. And in the process, he's given uh, Bibi Netanyahu a little heart attack. Okay, Aaron, you know, uh, uh, Tzvi Barel, a uh, leading pundit in Haaretz, writes today that instead of Iran knocking on Washington's doors to talk about the nuclear deal and sanctions, it seems the U.S. is the one courting Tehran. Are you surprised that it's not Iran courting the United States, but rather the other way around? What do you think about that? Okay, we're not, the United States, Donald Trump, is not courting <laughs> Iran. And in fact, actually, we don't have to look very far. Uh, to see that Donald Trump here is actually keeping his campaign promises. He promised to get the United States out of the Iran nuclear deal. He did just that. And he promised to renegotiate a better deal. And I think that that factors into his statement that he's willing to meet with the Iranian president without preconditions. But don't forget that Donald Trump is not coming to the bargaining table um, like President Obama did, which was projecting weakness mm. and then signing a disastrous nuclear accord that kept Iran perpetually uh, within the uh, range of acquiring nuclear weapon weapons. Donald Trump took Iran, took Iran, got us out of the nuclear deal, is in the process of imposing very <clears throat> strong, devastating sanctions, okay. uh, has very clearly given a green light for Israel to devastate right. Iran uh, militarily in Syria. We so he's to. coming from the position of strength and not weakness. Okay. Well, I think it's going to, I mean, I mean, the, the, the summit with uh, Kim Jong-un in Singapore was such a great photo op. I'm really looking forward to this one, wherever it's going to happen, if it happens. Anyway, that is all the time we have. I want to thank our panelists, Aaron Klein in New York, Deborah Shushan in D.C., and Vivian Berkovich here in T.A. Thanks all, guys. Good to see you. Stay with us. We'll be right back with our senior international correspondent, Owen Alderman, with some outside news. Stick around.